Right now we have two great guests. We have a journalist who has been covering the Assange case via the video link and has been uh, doing a great job of reporting very specific things that have gone on during the trial, Kevin Gastola. And of course, we also have activist and uh, co-host of Slow News Day show, Steve Poikinen, and they are both here, correct? Yep. And okay, great. They're both here and they're going to talk to us about what's happening, what's happening next in the Julian Assange case, as we just heard the um, the courts, you know, uh, approval of the of the appeal. And uh, thank you guys for coming on today and speaking with us. Oh, yeah. It, uh, it looks like Kevin's having uh, <clears throat> an audio connection issue at okay. the moment, but hopefully that buffs out. Um, and it is always wonderful to be on the couch. <laughs> and um, you're currently in Denver, right? I am. Yeah, we just wrapped with our first uh, event for the weekend and hit up various uh, media outlets throughout the Denver area and um, bullhorned in front of them for a while, passed out some flyers, talked to some people, and, and in general, um, we just created well-mannered frivolity. Good, good. Um, yeah, so Steve, I'll start with you as, as so Kevin um, gets the audio situated. You know, you're in Denver right now for Julian. After hearing and reading what happened in the last uh, most recent preliminary appeal hearing, what is your opinion uh, as to how the court justified their decision to reverse the, the prior decision and permit the U.S. government's appeal? It, it's, I mean, it's, it's cartoonish. It is. The, we quite literally weeks before this appeal found out by the admission of the witness himself, Sigurd Thordeson, that he had fabricated his testimony, that he was recanting his testimony. His testimony makes up uh, a significant portion of the prosecution's argument. It, um, on its face, should have dismissed the case. But that's something that, that we've said surrounding this entire travesty the entire time. There are more this moment should have dismissed the case moments then there are oh the prosecution had a good point there you know it's it's out of hand and i don't i don't know what it's going to to take to get people to cover it accurately to get people to talk about it to the point to where the i don't the necessary amount of pressure is put on people that can actually move the needle about it we're not going to stop screaming about it um, but I mean, this is beyond phallus or it's be, you know, beyond farce at this point. Yeah. I, I mean, absolutely agree. It's been a kangaroo court the entire time. And, uh, Kevin, are you able to hear us now? I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate your work that you've done on this. Uh, I just wanted you to lay out a few key points made during the uh, recent preliminary appeal as to why, how they justified their decision. Yeah, so essentially it almost seems like the High Court of Justice, this appeals court, basically threw up their hands and said, you know what, it's no use trying to stop the US government. Let's just give them what they want and let them come in to our courtroom and they can argue whatever they would like and uh, we'll deal with it during the hearing. Uh, that's one way to look at it if you want to believe that this isn't going to actually affect whether Assange is extradited or not. Like it might be good for Julian Assange um, in the end because uh, the High Court of Justice can discredit almost everything that the U.S. has to say. Um, but obviously, you know, that, that, that might be, you might accuse me of ignoring some of the good work of people at outfits like Declassified UK with Matt Kennard and others who have examined the conflicts of interests that are in the court system in the United Kingdom and, and say that this is just, you know, the UK doing the bidding of the US government. So what we get from this decision is basically saying that facts get to be up for debate, essentially. Uh, we are going against the facts that were relied upon, and I can't believe I'm doing this given how disgusted I was with how Vanessa Baretzer handled the case at the district level, but they are taking the facts she relied upon 
to conclude that Julian Assange has a mental health disorder. You're taking the facts from two reliable doctors, Professor Michael Kopelman, who was the neuropsychiatrist who treated and, and, and uh, did his work with Julian Assange from May 2019 all the way to the end of the year and concluded that he had impulses from his mental health disorder that could feasibly result in suicide and that those needed to be uh, paid attention by the district judge when deciding whether to extradite him. And uh, so those facts, um, along with facts about the autism diagnosis that came up during the extradition hearing in September, uh, those facts should be disregarded in favor for the doctors who are on the side of the, U uh, uh, the United States government. Um, basically, this whole thing of Claire Dobbin, this, this you know, this, this robot mm. prosecutor, essentially, and I don't know if you've ever gotten to, I don't think anybody who has, only people with access to the feed have got to hear her talk, but she really speaks like a robot. Like she is, we, she uh, said, what? We did get to see her. We saw her enough to make a number of Cruella DeVille references. And, and uh, we, uh, yeah, yeah well, I mean, we, we were having some fun with her during the, the, second round the witness testimony round of that uh of what, what, you know how like computer devices get programmed and then sometimes they don't actually speak words like people talk them there's a unit in adx florence called the h unit that she will regularly call the h unit and it just adds i think to her robotic uh that's sadistic, beautiful. sadistic nature in in the courtroom is that uh, periodically words will roll off her tongue that makes it sound extra cruel what she is doing to Julian Assange. So, uh, so yeah, we get this part of the decision. We also get the part where they're going to contest whether you know. So, so they're contesting the risk of suicide. But then, I suppose what I should really flesh out is this fact that. They're turning uh, the concerns for safety that Julian Assange and Stella Morris have for themselves and for their children against them. They're basically saying that Professor Kopelman should be discredited. All of the work that he's done should be thrown out. This is the U.S. position. But now we have a high court of justice entertaining it, um, and they're basically saying uh, we'll, we'll allow the U.S. government to argue that we, they can discredit all the work of this doctor on the mere fact that he withheld from the court that Julian Assange had a relationship with Stella Morris. It's ridiculous. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous, you know? And, uh, but also, I think it's incredible that they aren't more understanding, don't believe that it was fair for the district court, which she was. She was relatively understanding. She said that it was a human choice to not tell the court. She believed that Michael Kobelman had an obligation as a witness to the court to disclose that he knew there was a relationship ongoing between Stella Morris and Julian Assange. But still, still, she wasn't going to use that to discredit everything he had done for the court to inform her about Julian Assange's mental state. And so again, I mean, I have to emphasize, this is somebody incredibly hostile to Julian Assange, right. who, who we thought time and time again didn't have his best interests, and yet could see through everything the U.S. was doing and recognize that these doctors were reliable. This is what is so crazy about this whole process, because back in September, when it was stupid o'clock in the morning in California <laughs> and it was, you know, whatever time it was in the UK and um, <clears throat> Kevin would, would jump in uh, from time to time on the action for Assange, you know, live coverage of it. It, that was when Beretzer um, had sat there and listened to weeks of testimony about how wonderful the U.S. prison systems were. They were veritable country clubs and there were color televisions and there were, you know, arts and crafts and things like that. And she's, you know, just sitting there and hearing this 
And at the same time, hearing from the prosecution what an absolute shithole Belmarsh prison is and how much better off Julian Assange is going to be once we get him to the safe confines of ADX Florence. And still, Baretzer was like, yeah, no, I've actually read about U.S. prisons. Uh, on that alone, I'm going to deny extradition. But there are these other key points that you know, we'll go over. And the prosecution's argument in a heartbeat switched from, you know, American prisons are, are wonderful uh, and we need to get Julian Assange there to, uh, uh, oh, well, we have to keep him in Belmarsh without bail because obviously Belmarsh is a much safer place for him, even though we just spent three weeks telling you that it was quite literally hell on earth. I, I you know, Kevin, you got to see... Julian, I've I've heard from other people that had the link that he did not look good. Can you um, comment a little bit on what you saw? And Steve, you can piggyback off of what he says. Oh, so uh, yeah, I mean, he he looks like anybody who's in prison. Basically, uh, he came. He was brought to this room to tune in via video link, and you know, he just. He had all the clothes that you're supposed to wear to court, but he didn't really put them on. Like he had this uh, collared shirt and he had a necktie, but he didn't tie it up. And he had, he had these big spectacles. Usually we haven't seen him wearing these big spectacles before. So, you know, I, I don't know if Julian has contacts or, or, or if he's got some kind of problems with his eyesight recently, but anyways, I haven't seen him in these big, huge, I mean, they were like thick glasses. I haven't seen him in these before. And it just, you know, it it made him look frail. It made him look like somebody who really does need medical. And like everything that we're hearing from the doctors, it almost like confirmed those opinions that he really does need help. It's all the more reason why it is incredibly humane that he's still in Belmarsh at this moment. Um, because it goes up, it goes entirely against the decision of the district court to keep him in jail. Because if he does have all of these issues, the last place to be receiving treatment would be in a prison. That's just that's just basic common sense yeah. right there. Uh, so the other thing is, I did see him after the hearing. I wrote about this that uh, Belmarsh was called up by the court because his defense attorney. Edward Fitzgerald didn't get to say goodbye to Julian Assange. And so they brought him back to the room and Julian was there and uh, his, his attorney said, Hey, uh, we're actually not on a private link. You know, they, you know, by the way, they're sharing, Julian has to share his link with the same journalists who are hostile to him, who think that he's not a journalist. So like, anyways, he doesn't even get his own way to connect to the court without having interference from people who despise him. Uh, but he's there and his attorney tells him that, you know, you may not want to talk. Um, it's not really private. And he launches anyways into his reaction to what he just saw with the high court. And I, he was astonished. I mean, he said, look, I, He's an expert. Michael Kobelman was an expert. An expert has an obligation to protect the safety of my family. Um, and he couldn't, he couldn't process this idea that somehow Michael Kobelman had done something wrong in, in refusing to disclose a relationship. Because one thing I didn't get to in, in talking about this was, and he said this in the court, he, he said there's a sawed off gun. Uh, well, he's referring to the fact that David Morales, the UC Global director of this company that was contracted, we believe, by the CIA, had his home raided by police in Spain. And they found two weapons, at least, that had the serial numbers erased on them. And he didn't have any ownership licenses for this. This is a man that has ties to the Israeli military, again, working for intelligence people in the United States. What's the plans? Why do you have these like black market guns in your house? What do you want to do with them? Um, not to mention that 
you know, now he's involved in this case against the company. There are people who stalked him. Uh, there were UC Global people who were trying to collect his children's diapers so that they could do DNA testing. David Morales was talking about kidnapping and poisoning Julian Assange. Uh, you had, we believe it's connected, uh, Baltazar Garzon, who's a really well-known, esteemed lawyer, human rights attorney, had his office burglarized by people. Um, they were wearing balaclavas. Uh, we don't know who they were, but again, we think it's associated with these people who are basically spooks for hire. Right. And so, so all of this is, Julian, like, how could you not see that you have to protect me? Right. The court should protect me. There's a privacy case going on, a, a case in Spain right now um, that that says that crimes were committed and that you should take seriously. And that's why you should care about all of this. And so anyways, um, finally, he did he did leave. But we got to hear him try and process the decision that was made by this high court. Right. Morales, too, got stopped trying to flee Spain got stopped at the, the border at Portugal and was trying to get out of the country. He had a court date coming. It, this is, and shout out to um, Max and the Gray Zone for like, there's an entire UC Global archive on the Gray Zone's website. Um, and they've done, you know, some exhaustive uh, journalism on this. And again, this is another one of those situations where on its face, it's enough to, to throw out the entire case. But because this is the Five Eyes versus Julian Assange, the normal rules of law, be they, you know, local, UK, US, Ecuadorian, international, they don't matter anymore. The, there are people inside the court system that are trying to do i think maybe the best they can with you know within the confines of the actual law but even they have to know that it doesn't that's not necessarily what matters here and that in and of itself it's the death knell uh, of free press it's the death knell of activism people need to get off their ass about this yeah I mean, with everything that's happening to the encroaching like surveillance state <laughs> and all of the uh, surrounding narratives around that, uh, it doesn't seem good for journalism in America to, as an understatement. Um, but what can we expect in the October hearing now that we know the results of the appeal and what is the defense likely to focus on? So I just like to make sure that we're clear here that what the United States government is doing, you mentioned the surveillance state, the prison state is on trial mm -hmm. in Julian Assange's extradition case. Mm -hmm. And what, what they're essentially going to argue before this high court at the end of October and what they've been arguing in their submissions to the court is that they can't guarantee the human rights of Julian Assange. Right. And so you should let us put him on trial. Again, we're gonna have to keep him in a jail where, where we can't guarantee he's gonna be treated fairly, but he'll have to just suffer through that. Because then when he's done, after we've convicted him in our show trial under the US Espionage Act with a law that's over a hundred years old that we know was passed and used to go against people engaged in freedom of speech against wars, after we're done, we'll let Australia have him since he's an Australian citizen and he can go live there because we have this treaty, which we didn't tell you about in September, but we've had it all along and we didn't think we were gonna have to use it as a, as a excuse to get you to approve this uh, extradition. But by the way, we'll just tell you that we recognize that everything's so brutal and we cannot take care of people who are brought to the United States We'll let Australia have him. Australia can try to protect his human rights where he's from. It's absurd. It's absolutely absurd. And essentially it means that the US is going to not only be defending the political case against a journalist in this appeal court, but they're also trying to salvage any future they have of extraditing people who have 
any sorts of physical or mental health ailments. And we know almost every other person on this planet has some kind of thing that they could claim is affecting them, especially after they've been confined to a prison or a jail for a year or two years, you're gonna develop something that you can use to protect you from being extradited. And so they're gonna, the, the thing that's at risk here is their ability to actually even extradite people to the United States who they've accused of crimes. Like they're they're at risk of like losing the ability to convince a UK court that they can treat people fair enough in the United States to be put on trial for crimes. That could infect like that could infect actual like terrorists, by the way. Like, I mean, there's there's biases that suggest that that won't happen, but like there are people who could be accused of very serious crimes who won't ever be brought to the United States because of this prison system in the United States. Like that's what's going on in this trial. And then of course, you know, back to Julian, obviously what they're going to argue is that we shouldn't, we shouldn't care about the things we've heard about how people are treated at Florence, uh, ADX Florence. We shouldn't care about the hellhole within. We shouldn't care about the way that the justice department could designate him for special administrative measures um, we should we should take these assurances. You put assurances in in, in major quotes uh, because they are saying things, but they're not actually backed up by any concrete promise. Because within these promises to treat him well and not designate him as like a national security prisoner who has no rights, who can't communicate freely with his family, who will have trouble communicating with his attorney and preparing his defense within those pledges are major, major loopholes that suggest that they could get around this at any moment. And so, I mean, I think they're going to be doing a whole lot of lying, which is what they've been doing throughout this entire case. But basically in Oct on October 27th, 28th, I think those are the dates, we're going to basically just hear a bunch of lies that the defense aren't going to have a difficult time dismantling because they're not even that developed. I mean, they're not even doing that much work to help get this past the high court. Uh, Steve, do you have anything to add uh, regarding that? And do what, like, do you, do you think that defense has anything up their sleeve since you've been involved in uh, the Assange defense um, with the Assange defense team? I it just, they play it so close to the, the vest that, it's almost impossible to know what the defense team is thinking. Um, at least from whatever, you know, I'm not like on the inside of those conversations or anything. Um, so I, you know, it, but watching it, observing it, it, it is, it's, I, I hate Monday morning quarterbacking a legal team. I really do because all of the stuff that I would want to yell in the middle of a courtroom is probably like, not allowable in the first place you know not that not not that i would be swearing or just the points that i would raise and all that kind of stuff i don't know i don't um i would hope that the defense is going to come into this appeal uh and simply state all of the reasons why julian assange's rights have been violated and there's no conceivable way that anything resembling a normal judicial trial should go forward the yeah i you know and again this is why i'm not a lawyer because i would want to tell the high court up front like you know that you're participating in a travesty of justice right you know that david morales was hired by the cia through sheldon adelson at the Sands Casino with the head of the security, you know, who former CIA. They're like, it's, it's just from start to finish so unconscionable that it, I don't know. It almost seems like the trial's a pretense at this point, you know, and that um, if he winds up back in Australia, I don't, yeah, again, and I'm rambling a little bit, but I've got a lot of thoughts coming in at once. Um, I don't, and Kevin, I want your opinion on this. I don't think the Biden administration wants this on their shoulders. I don't think that uh, 
President Kamala Harris, you know, three months from now, is going to want this on on her shoulders. Um, so passing the buck to Australia is probably like their best arguable choice. But I don't. I, what do you think? I've got a whole rant. I've done it in a couple places, but <laughs> essentially it goes like this. I don't have a whole lot of respect for Democrats like Biden and Harris. And maybe I'm being redundant here and I should just say I don't have a lot of respect for Democrats because they're all pretty much this way, but they won't defend what they want to do out in the open. Right. So what I mean is you got Mike Pompeo, who clearly advertises what he intends to do. Jeff Sessions advertises exactly what he plans to do. People in the Trump administration tell you without being bashful or being cowardice, they tell you that we do not think Julian Assange is a journalist. He has no First Amendment rights. We are not going to give him human rights. We are going to treat him like shit and we are going to bring him to the United States and we are going to put him on trial. We're going to treat him like an enemy of the state. And we aren't going to tell you that what we're doing is wrong. We don't care what it says about the United States that we are doing this. This is what we're going to do because it's about power. And uh, the CIA, by the way, wants this trial. So we're going to do it on their behalf. And they go ahead and do it. But then with the Biden administration, with people like Biden or Anthony Blinken, he's the worst. They get asked questions and they don't want to talk about it. Attorney Merrick Garland, totally silent. They want to pretend like this isn't happening. They want us to think that this isn't going on while Biden is in office. And the reason is because they know they can't defend this to the public. Nobody who has asked them a question about Julian Assange in the last year has gotten an answer as to why they're continuing this extradition or why they're doing this prosecution. Um, so that leads me to believe that they're actually, uh, you know, in my view, I think they're worse than Donald Trump because at least those people will defend what they're doing and then I can attack them based on the merits of what they've said are the justifications for going after Julian Assange and I can expose them for being filth. But these people are the same kind of garbage but they won't actually come out in the open and be transparent about it. So what they're doing is they're thinking that if they hide, we won't notice what's going on but also, I think it's even more sinister because they're going to be they're going to let this go in my view all the way to the Supreme Court drag this out for two or three more years. They're going to let this legal limbo continue with Julian Assange and then in my view when it comes time to actually extradite him to the United States either Joe Biden or Merrick Garland or someone's going to come out and say, "You know what? We're going to um, abandon this case. We're going to drop this." Cuz to actually bring him to the US would be bad for us. And the reason why it's bad for the United States is I want you to pay attention to all the clips that have come out in the last couple of months and all the clips that are coming out in the next year from people who are actually authoritarians or dictators of countries who are trampling on the press freedom of their citizens. And when they get asked questions by BBC correspondents or when they get asked questions by CNN correspondents about why they won't protect journalists in their country. They say, we don't have to listen to you. You don't have to, you don't get to ask me questions about this because you've got Julian Assange jailed in Belmarsh prison and you're trying to put him on trial. So you know what? I don't have to tell you why I don't take care of journalists' rights because you don't protect journalists' rights either. So that's why ultimately they're going to have to abandon this prosecution because nobody thinks they have any credibility on anything they're talking about with human rights and press freedom so long as this continues. Do, do they then pass the buck to the UK who says, oh, we've got this official secrets act that's been laying around uh, that we could now open prosecution against Julian Assange for and tie this up in court for another seven, 10 years. Ray McGovern, when he wrote uh, his piece immediately after full appeal was granted, was uh, said something that struck me in that the Stratfor email the, where it's, uh, you know, move him from country to country for 25 years, keep him tied up in the court. Ray observed that move him from court to court 
is equally as effective, essentially the same thing. Yeah, but they lost. See, this is why they needed the Swedish case, but the prosecutors couldn't manage it in, in a manner that had any veneer of fairness and due process. So they lost that as a, as a way to nail Julian Assange. Um, and, and, and so, you know, sure, maybe the UK could be the client state that steps up. Maybe it could be Australia. Who knows? Maybe Australia wants to bring. I mean, there's been a huge decline in Australia when it comes to protections for whistleblowers. There's a case of David McBride who's under attack. Um, there's a restrictions on journalists. They're raiding the offices of the Australia Broadcasting Corporation who are doing stories on the military or intelligence agencies. And uh, so maybe they could. His own home country could target him and put him on trial in Australia for the United States's benefit. Um, I mean, that's the thing that's really tricky is after this is all over, he has to find some place he can go and obtain asylum. And so far, the only country and government that has spoken up on his behalf recently is AMLO, uh, the leader of Mexico. Has, yeah, has and he just had Commander X extradited back up to Santa Rita. Yeah, the, so he, the yeah. After Kamala Harris was there visiting him, or sorry, three days after Kamala Harris was there visiting him. Which shows you you can't count on Mexico to defend you against the United States. They just don't have the power to prevent people from swooping in and taking you. Did you have a question, Johnny? Yeah, hey, guys. Can they hear you? Yes. Okay. I can hear Johnny Buttons. Hey, hey. guys. Uh, glad to have you on. Uh, since I have both of you all on, uh, I kind of wanted to ask this question about kind of like the timeline, right? So perhaps, you know, Kevin, you can help me with the judicial process, right? And uh, But Steve, help me with the timeline. So Julian Assange was a free, independent, sovereign man. He was uh, the publisher on WikiLeaks, and he published these, uh, all these documents. And then uh, he, he ended up in, uh, in Ecuador. And then from there is kind of where I'm, I'm lost in my timeline. I, I, don't, I'm, I, I don't know. I have a a black hole there for for the timeline go ahead steve it's the embassy he was in the embassy in uk so and, and he actually had to do uh uh some house arrest before that um but uh in 2010 i think um but so he entered the ecuadorian embassy um in 2012 12. yep and then for the next seven and a half years was a resident of the embassy but also had ecuadorian citizenship that rafael correa had had granted him so on april 11th 2019 when uh his not just his asylum but effectively his citizenship uh was stripped with zero due process that that's when he was trafficked in the belmarsh where he sits today uh, almost two and a half years into it. It'll be two and a half years in uh, in a couple of weeks here. Why, why did the UK grab him? Well, because the embassy was in London. Okay. Like, I think that that was more a, a territorial, like just, you know, that's the jurisdiction that's there. In the same way that if, you know, a... Uh, uh, Let's say a uh, hot-headed Peruvian Johnny Buttons was uh, a Peruvian national uh, was in the U.S. and was doing some shit, uh, got arrested. He would be held in the U.S. awaiting an extradition trial, awaiting you know something like that. So that's essentially what this is. It's just because it's Julian Assange, he's being held in the Guantanamo Bay of the United Kingdom. Um, his initial charge, though, was uh, when they dragged him out of the embassy was a bail jumping violation, which they gave him the longest serving sentence in the modern era of the UK criminal justice system for for jumping bail. He got 50 weeks for that. Um, but so he hasn't been charged with anything since so correct me if i'm wrong about this kevin somewhere around september of uh 2019 when uh, the yeah, yeah. jumping sentence was effectively up because it got reduced yeah. to like 35 weeks or something like that so whatever 35 weeks from april 11th is it, 
Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So we so he served a sentence, um, and then he was kept in jail. Um, and he, and basically, just so we're clear here, they've always used the fact that Julian Assange saw asylum as a, a, a negative thing. It hasn't been like they basically won't recognize the institution, the United States and the British government. Um, and Ecuador uh, at this moment as well, based because they're they're you know, Moreno has effectively endorsed handling Julian Assange in this manner. So he they say that he's a fugitive, and in order to evade justice, he sought asylum in the Ecuador embassy. Which you know, I mean, we know how empire works, and for those who are dissidents in China or Russia, if they went to our embassy and fled some political case. We wouldn't call them fugitives, but that's what we're doing with Julian Assange. Right. Well, here's the thing. Countries don't grant asylum to people <laughs> who are known fleeing criminals. Right. That's just not how that works. Well, they you should know, have. had to demonstrate that he was being politically persecuted before the government of Ecuador would grant the asylum. Like, there was a process there. It, it's, not like, it's not like he turned up and said, hey, look, the cops are right behind me. Can yeah. I walk in for a minute and we can sort it out? Like, that's, that's not how that works. So, uh, yeah. That's a really good point, Steve. Because they did have a press conference, and I think, I um, uh, forget who the foreign minister was, but he was there, and they presented the application that Julian Assange submitted with all of his reasons um, and there were really good people who were involved in helping Julian put this together, and he got asylum. Right. So then uh, kind of like the judicial process uh, that he's going through right now, the U.K. High Court, right? It's uh, obviously the judicial process is a little bit different than the U.S. Uh, I had some experience with an election fraud case here in the U.S., so I'm just kind of curious about the process uh, in the U.K. High Court. Uh, so recently... Uh, there was an appeal because uh, uh, we all know that um, the judge barrister uh, denied the extradition. That was the original lawsuit, right? That he, they wanted to extradite Julian Assange to the U.S. so then he can face trial there. Uh, and uh, so they made an appeal, which means that they uh, contested the decision from uh, the judge, for those who may not know. And then... Uh, so then what's the next step after this? Yeah, so just so people understand, what the U.S. gets to do or any country that has an extradition treaty with the U.K. get to do, um, they go before this high court and they say, okay, we want to appeal this lower court, and these are our five or six grounds. So it could be like, uh, we think you didn't understand the extradition treaty. Uh, or we think the district court didn't understand the extradition treaty. That's actually one of the things that the U.S. is arguing. And uh, or then like we actually think he wouldn't have his rights violated if he's transported or if he's extradited to the United States. Um, and so anyways, then the high court decides if you have grounds to challenge those. Um, it's supposed to be on issues of law. Okay, I don't want to like be a boring, <laughs> boring scholar, lawyer type here, but like we're not supposed to find the arguments that are happening in court to be that interesting or even that substantial because they should be about points of law that we don't really know because like we're not attorneys in the United Kingdom. So the fact that we're arguing over the mental health of Julian Assange says that this is corrupted because they shouldn't be talking about that kind of a thing in the appeal hearing because that should be settled. That's something that district uh, that the judge decided at the lower level. It should not be open for debate in the appeal court. So anyways, they go before and then the appeal court is going to make a decision based on the grounds that they've granted the U.S., which at this point, what that hearing was at the end of July was the U.S. challenging the fact that there were two grounds that the high court didn't want to allow uh, for debate, basically. And so now everything's open season and uh, as far as the grounds that they want to appeal. And so, again, none of it has to do with journalism, really, honestly. Like they're not, the appeal court isn't even arguing about the publication of documents. 
um, none of that. All of that is already is part of the lower court decision, and um, you know it doesn't matter because Julian won his case. So the appeal court will make a decision based on what the U.S. has brought before it, and then they're going to appeal to the Supreme Court if they lose, which is, in my view, a, a distinct possibility. But if for some reason it flips around and Julian Assange loses in the appeal court, then it gets really complicated because for the folks at home, Julian Assange's defense has a cross appeal that they wanna do before the appeal court, but they've been told they have to wait until after the US is done in order to, to make an attempt to appeal. So it's extraordinarily complicated. And again, while this is all unfolding, a man who is really, really, really vulnerable is still sitting in jail and going through all sorts of, of, of problems that he shouldn't have to go through. And uh, But if they grant that cross appeal, then that's going to extend the amount of time before there's an appeal at the Supreme Court level in the UK. And then that'll be the last stage for the United States. If they lose before the Supreme Court, then they, they can't have Julian Assange. And I know we've talked about the intricacies of the case, but I really wanted to bring it back home with the importance of why why Julian is such an important man. On the left here in, you know, in, in politics wise, you get a lot of people who say, oh, he's just one guy. Why do you guys care so much about him? Uh, what he's just one guy. There's so many people out there experiencing all these hardships and, you know, not not having health care, not having all these things, which is true. However, Julian Assange historically in 2011 said that regarding Afghanistan, and this is so prescient right now, the goal is to use Afghanistan to wash money out of the tax bases of the U.S. and Europe through Afghanistan and back into the hands of a transnational security elite. The goal is endless war, not a successful war. He said this in 2011, right, you know, at, before, shortly before getting uh, taken in. And I think it's important that people uh, understand that he was talking about this, af about Afghanistan at a time where mainstream media was ignoring it. And mainstream media has largely ignored Afghanistan until basically recently. And so, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I, now it's a crime uh, that we left. Sorry to right. interrupt. <laughs> no, yeah. So I just wanted you guys to, to, to talk about like how, I mean, he's, he's in prison right now for that for being a journalist and that's not being talked about enough as to how right he was about everything so so kevin ha had his uh his rant that he's given a few times and i have mine on this exact subject that i will try to abbreviate i was yelling it in the the street in denver earlier this morning um all activism no matter what it is no matter from what sphere hinges on our ability, your ability as activists to communicate with people who don't know the message, who may not know enough about the message. The only way that happens is with a free press. If we as activists have no one to communicate to or we're only speaking to people who already agree with us, that's going absolutely nowhere. And I am addressing every single activist with every single cause right now. This is not specific to me. This is not specific to Action for Assange or any of the, you know, those organizations. This is all activism without a free press, without a free Julian Assange. Activism itself can only be approved by the state and for purposes that are going to reinforce the state. That's not activism. That's public relations. Yeah. And, and what Julian had to say is very prescient. I mean, Ashraf Ghani, who was the president of Afghanistan, he absconded with like $170 million of the US's money. And he was looking for a country that would take him. And he, I guess he couldn't get into Tajikistan, which I didn't think would really care either way if he wanted to come to have safe haven there. But eventually he ended up in the United Arab Emirates. Um, and he's got all this money, like like bags and bags of hundred of over well over a hundred million dollars that he stole from the people of Afghanistan. That was supposed to be, you know, if that government was actually anything decent, which we know it wasn't, 
was supposed to be for rebuilding the country and, and helping the people there. Um, so he, he understood. And he was talking about that before they did the Afghanistan papers in the Washington Post. That was primarily from officials in the US government who talked about all the corruption around the slush funds and the money that was just pouring into Afghanistan and going to warlords and going to people with all kinds of conflicts of interest who had their own agendas and really weren't out to help anybody. You know, we hear all this about we, we were there to, to, to save the girls, the Afghani girls and everything. No, sorry. Um, the way that the US was handling the war, it was just about funneling wealth to a bunch of warlords and elites that were in Afghanistan. And that's something that Julian Assange understood. And the Afghan war logs, which he received from Chelsea Manning, were incredibly important. But also what you should understand is it's a core part of the way in which the US has fashioned this political case against Julian Assange. You know, the core thing in the US case, it's, and it's really amazing to think about this after the week we've been through. The core thing is that he exposed informants and other sources of the United States government to retaliation by the Taliban and other uh, militant groups in Afghanistan by publishing these files. Well, you know, um, I'm really pleased that our U.S. troops are gone and that we look to be winding down this occupation and it's going to finally be over. But let's just be clear here. Nobody did more to boost the Taliban in the last 20 years than the United States because everything we've done and all the supposed enemies of the U.S. are in a much better position today than they were before these Iraq war log, uh, these Afghanistan war logs were published. And what we're trying, what the U.S. is trying to do, is complete the criminalization of journalism. And they've already succeeded in punishing a source. They got Chelsea Manning. They did that. They tried to get a source to testify against the journalist by subpoenaing her and dragging her before a grand jury. And she stood up and resisted and did more than anyone probably could have imagined she would be able to do under those circumstances. She lasted for a year and then finally they gave up and they let her go. But what they want to do is get Julian Assange so that they not only can use this law to go after sources, but they can also go after the source and the journalist when they want to target national security journalism when they want to target journalism about this empire. And that is what is crucial because there are very, very few people who have resources. You know, we know very clearly that those in the media establishment don't want to practice this kind of journalism and take risks, even though they have the resources and the lawyers and the people to protect them from attacks from the US government. So it falls on people like the gray zone and, 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 you know, I, I don't feel like I have enough. I'm, I'm not adequately equipped to face the government. So I'm very careful about what I take on. But those outlets that do dare to take on these stories and know that they're going to be clamped down by the very powerful Justice Department and what it's capable of doing with the FBI and, and the political elites that are going to come for them and demonize them in the media, uh, you know, uh, they're trying to complete a loop here, something that they've been working. This is this is 15 or 20 years in the making. It goes all the way back to the years right after the September 11th attacks. It goes all the way back to the this Afghanistan war. Um, and they've been building this up so that it's almost impossible for people who are outside the media establishment to do journalism with sources who are inside the government and can tell the people of the United States and the world how wars are being prosecuted or how the surveillance state is being engineered. Exactly. I mean, a hundred percent. I mean, this is all coming to fruition now. Uh, Steve, did you have anything else to say before I wrap this up? Um, if you're anywhere near the Denver area tomorrow, come out and see us at noon. We are going to be at Civic Center Park at the, uh, the Greek pavilion there. Um, bring friends, um, bring water. And, and uh, let's see, I do think that there's going to be um, some in-person events on October 12th when Julian goes back to court. Um, other than that, 
I don't think so. Well, thank you. B. Uh, great to see you again, Kevin. Yeah, great yeah. to see you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Kevin, let us know where we can find you and any other last thoughts. Well, yeah. So first, thanks. I really appreciated having the conversation. Thanks for letting me rant. Uh, <laughs> so if you wanted to have more coverage of Julian Assange's case. I also do coverage of whistleblowers. It's not about partisan whistleblowers. It's not about like the Democrats favorite whistleblower or even the Republicans favorite whistleblowers. It's about whistleblowers who often fall outside of the confines of US politics. And uh, you can go to the dissenter.org, T-H-E dissenter.org. And uh, it's a free newsletter. Um, and uh, even though there's some exclusive stuff that people pay, but it's a free newsletter. And that's where you can get the dispatches and reports from court that'll be coming in October. And, uh, you know, Mohammed El Mazi is a good reporter in the UK, has been helping me do some coverage of this case. So you can look forward to that when we have the next round uh, in Assange's case. Awesome. Thank Moment. you guys so much. Appreciate it. All right, see ya. Bye.